you've seen before you, I think, at least for the most expressive photographic material that you're going to see of the Ashwayat or the approval communities. And she had been working on this idea for years, actually. And uh, she didn't know what she wanted to do with these, Im these images that she had taken. Uh, she's basically been traveling to these sort of peripheral areas of Cairo and, and taking photographs for years and sort of hoping that something would come together at a later time. And so we sort of get this idea of how elaborate these places are. Whereas this sort of thing, this sort of uh, trend, I guess you could say, uh, is occurring all over Africa. And in fact, all over places like India and China as well. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of people across the world that have been basically disenfranchised and kicked out of formal society. And this is the only answer they've been able to, to basically take advantage of. That. They all have slum communities uh, that basically follow the same, uh, same steps that these do. What differentiates Cairo from any other, uh, any other question that I've come across in this trend is the fact that these are really well-organized attempts to, to create a community uh, where, whereas they've been denied one. Uh, in, uh, in formal uh, social circles, and these are huge structures. I mean, that, that provide housing for, like I said, millions of people. And, and, and the people who build them are active, always actively trying to connect them to formal society in ways, in material ways, such as uh, getting clean water and electricity. And so there is this attempt, uh, to a certain degree, to build their own society because they've basically been kicked out of the one that already exists and within central uh, Cairo. And uh, one scholar has uh, referred to it as uh, quiet encroachment, as a, as a form of uh, resistance, basically, of, of protest, of active resistance. And many of these towers are uh, as perhaps ugly and stark as they can be, or there always is this attempt to beautify them to a certain degree. Is, uh, many of these towers, the name of their, they're actually named, the Moon Tower, Tower of Paradise, you know, Tower of Hope, that, that uh, Boreal Mall is actually actually taken from that trend in these uh, communities. And so the name of the tower would often be inscribed with white brick on the side of it. Moon Tower is one that happens a lot. And what you'll find is, is that these communities are advertised by the builders in the same way that normal apartment complexes in, you know, let's say the suburbs of, uh, of Detroit are advertised. And there's print advertisements and it's very well organized and they say, come to, come to Moon Tower. We have apartments opening in 2010 and they're beautiful and it's a paradise. And so there is this active attempt at creating sort of a mirror world uh, of the one that they aren't able to gain access to. And so by introducing this tower, this uh, mini ash by ash into the space, you can see how there was uh, sort of a, an, an active exercise against that control going on. And the, the realization of the project and the project itself once it was realized sort of brought these people into that space to problematize the, uh, the treatment of the space as a clean and sort of uniform and absolute area. And so there is this, uh, general fear of societal collapse in Egypt and other places like Egypt, and obviously this is occurring on a global scale. So uh, there is that fear there that uh, there is a tremendous amount of our society, it's, it's estimated that there are more than one billion people that, that live upon one dollar a day, if not less, and live within communities that are similar to the Ashwayat throughout the world, and that as that number grows, what does that say about us and our social organizational fabric? I mean, what does that, uh, that sort of dis uh, discrepancy between wealth value say about, I guess, capitalism as a social ordering uh, tool, and if that's brought to its logical conclusion, what will happen to us as a race, as a people? And I think these are all ideas that are very central to this work. So what I, I think that she's trying to say is that there are these attempts by, by I guess, dominant capital one, by government forces that are obviously playing into the hands of dominant capital to present this image of Egypt that is, one, unitary and not multi-spectral, uh, but two is beautiful, which is not the case for most Egyptians. Most Egyptians are never locked into spaces like this. Uh, definitely not most of the people from Cairo. And so she is saying that this is sort of a farce, and that, uh, and that this is more of the reality. And by bringing that reality from the periphery back into the center, where I believe that she believes uh, it belongs, she's sort of bringing attention to these problems that are swept under the surface that was also produced by the same urban disenfranchised by members of that community. So they were brought into this space to build this tower next to the Palace of Fine Art. And so they all come into this tower space and sort of uh, become part of the social matrix and the social network that is at the heart of this, this act of resistance.